In 2003, Casey Mears had probably the worst rookie season in the history of the NASCAR Cup Series. Over 36 entire races, he had five finishes better than 20th, and a whopping zero top tens. Top tens are a metric used primarily by NASCAR as nearly every other motorsport celebrates the top three finishers of a race with a podium. The most top tens a driver has gotten in a single NASCAR Cup Series season is 45, done three times by Joe Weatherly and Ned Jarrett twice. The lowest number of top tens a Cup champion has gotten in their championship year was four by Retta Byron in the first Cup Series season in 1949, which had a grand total of eight races the entire season. That's still half the year's races in Top 10s. What I'm trying to say is that getting lots of Top 10s is the best way to win a NASCAR Cup Series championship. Usually. So that really got me thinking. What's the least amount of top 10s a Cup Series driver could get in a season and still become champion? We are going to find out today. Can you win a championship in NASCAR Thunder 2004 with zero top 10s? For this challenge, I decided to play on season mode for once. Let's get this challenge video started with an early fun fact. The shortest race distance in any EA NASCAR game you can run is 3%. The only way to access 3% race lengths are in Season Mode in NASCAR Thunder 2004. I thought about doing it, but decided to use Familiar Ground with 5% races. Unlimited fuel and tires was off, and cautions were on. I also kept it on Legend difficulty to keep things interesting. For the sake of realism, I decided to drive as Casey Mears with the hope to replicate his 2003 season. I've also just been looking for an excuse to play as Casey Mears on this channel. Season mode is basically the same as career mode with none of the fun stuff. Your car is equal to your competition like in arcade mode. The best way I can describe the feel of an arcade mode car in NASCAR Thunder 2004 is around a 75 overall career mode car. It's fast in all the right places, your fuel mileage actually matches up to the AI, and every race is easily winnable. The car isn't superhuman though, tire degradation means something, and the car will fall off hard at the end of runs at some tracks. But we haven't even gotten started yet. We've got 36 races ahead and we've got a championship to win. It was time to head to Daytona. I got 8th place on the first lap of qualifying and decided to not waste another 47 seconds of my life and moved on to the race. On the first green flag of the season, I decided to try and draft up to the front with Jimmy Johnson. Jimmy Johnson is a solid B-level driver, which means he is good for a win or two every season, but he's never going to start on the front row and dominate every race like Stewart or Gordon would. I figure I want to work with anyone that is not an A-level driver if I'm going to have any hope of succeeding in this challenge. Another strategy I planned on employing in this challenge was absolute points maximization. Every single cup race, there are five bonus points awarded for leading a lap, and an additional five bonus points for leading the most laps in a race. That means there are an extra 360 points available in every single race just for leading the most laps. Maximizing points in any other challenge would mean winning the race and leading every lap. But since I can't finish top 10 in this challenge, someone else was going to end up leading laps and they would be getting 5 bonus points. This means that anyone else that finishes in the top 10 of one of these races could gain another 5 points on me if they lead a lap or, god forbid, lead the most laps. That means I need to strategically decide if I want to try and lead all but one lap in the race, or if I wanted to focus on manipulating the running order to my liking and leave everyone else to get bonus points on me. It was gonna be a season-long struggle. Anyway, sorry for the absolute dump of information right there. I pushed Jimmy Johnson to second and myself to third when Jimmy decided to abandon me for Jarrett and drive off. Without a lap led, I decided to take two tires on the pit lane to get a huge advantage on the AI. I didn't lead a single lap until lap 7 into lap 8, and the top 5 was littered with A-level drivers. At this point, I decided to employ my second major strategy of this challenge. I backed out of the gas and let the field catch up, and by the time the white flag waved, there was a screaming pack in my mirror. 
Matt Kenseth was third, and Jared was second. I have never in my life seen Matt Kenseth win a championship in NASCAR Thunder 2004 without help. So I encouraged Jared to go to the top line and then slammed on the brakes. This held Jared up, and Kenseth drove right past us both. No one else followed, essentially locking Kenseth into the win. At this point, I did everything I could to hold up as many A-level drivers as I could. We were in third gear on the exit of turn two as I was blocking two lanes of traffic. Ron and Newman got by on the bottom, which was unfortunate, but I was holding up Jared and Harvick, so I decided to stay committed. The good news is that it takes a long time to drive 2.5 miles when you aren't going very fast, so I had plenty of time to make the magic happen. I decided to hold up Stewart and Harvick on the bottom and let Jarrett go. Bill Elliott went by as well. He's also a solid B-level driver, so it wasn't much of a loss. I let a few more cars pass on the bottom until the 01 of Nadu got past me, and I found myself in the magical 11th place position. At this point, I swung the car down the track to slow everyone else up, and the first race couldn't have gone any better. Casey Mears crossed the line to finish in the 11th position. Get ready to hear me say that a lot, by the way. There's no way to tell if this is a good start to the season because we are not the points leader. I started 2003 ninth in points, but most importantly, I had zero top tens. For race number two at Rockingham, otherwise known as the Rock, I ran the worst lap of my life, but still got the pole on lap one. Yeah, qualifying is a bit easy in this game, isn't it? I was joined by Stewart on the front row, who was eager to begin his quest to make my life miserable for the entire challenge. I blew the first corner, but still managed to hold the lead. Stewart ran into me for a 30, but this was the only issue at the start of the race. I began driving off from the field by several seconds, leading my first laps of the season. Fun fact! In 2004, Casey Mears was running second and closing on the leader before losing a tire with 30 to go in the Bush race at Rockingham. This is one of many moments that I forgot to mention in my defense of Casey Mears video. I stayed out to lead lap 10 to lock in the most laps led bonus points, and after the stop had a massive leap. It took a long time for anyone to catch me. Coming to lap 14, I had Johnson behind me and wanted to keep him there since he finished ahead of me at Daytona. This allowed Bill Elliott to take the lead and drive off. Now I had to block two lanes. I let Johnson go because once again I figured he wouldn't be a problem in the long run and instead blocked the 8 car. Now I had a bunch of A-level drivers behind me. Earnhardt went high into turn 3 because of course he did and I moved up to block. This allowed Harvick to just drive to the inside like nothing. Since Harvick finished ahead of me last week, he could not be allowed to pass. So I went down to cover him off. This of course sent me spinning and the first caution of the challenge came out. I was spamming the X button to get the caution cutscene to start and stop leaning positions. The good news is that I needed to finish outside the top 10 anyway, so this just sped up the process. I restarted in 16th. At this point, I could have accepted the result and just rode to the finish, but I knew I needed Harvick and Earnhardt to finish behind me, so I strapped in, drove around everyone, and back into the top 10. Coming to two laps to go, I had the run to catch Harvick. I refused to let him finish ahead of me after that stupid caution. I literally drifted up in front of him and slammed on the brakes. Several random drivers were in the top 10 at this point, so I started letting them pass. Daytona 500 winner Kenseth got around, and eventually I found myself in 12th ahead of Harvick at the white. Managed to pass Waltrip back off on the final corner, and came to the line to finish 11th at Rockingham. Sadly, Bill Elliott did not win, and it was instead Johnson. Finishing 11th is worth 130 points, and leading the most laps is worth 10 points. Johnson winning without the most laps led was worth a total of 180 points. So this means every single race, someone is going to gain at least 40 points on me. This is a great visualization of the eternal struggle that will be winning a championship when you're guaranteed to lose points to at least eight drivers every week. After race two of 2003, I was 51 points out of the lead. For race three in Las Vegas, I got the pole on the second lap and struggled on the start. In the No Upgrades Challenge, I made mention a lot that your fire off speed on restarts is really bad in this game. 
It is better in season mode, but it is still not very good. Stuart led lap one and, more importantly, got five free bonus points no matter where he finishes from here. Las Vegas is a track where the AI is a bit stronger than usual and it took several laps and diving to the grass to get the lead from Stuart. It was over at that point, however, and I held the lead. Fun fact! Flat Las Vegas was Casey Mears' best track. It was the site of his best finish during his Nightmare 2003 season and was the place he got his first top 10 in 2004. I decided to maximize the possibility of leading most laps and pit on lap 8. Going that long meant it was Sterling Marlin with the lead. I was fine with this and joined the track third behind Stewart, which was less fine. Any other driver I would have let them keep second place, but I know that Tony Stewart in NASCAR Thunder 2004 is absolutely someone you don't want to give an advantage to. Coming to two laps to go, I had finally caught Stewart and began to screw him over. Annoyingly, right behind us was Jimmy Johnson, who I know finished ahead of me in both races thus far. It was more important to block the 48, so after all that work to catch Stewart, I watched him drive off again in second. I fell as low as 13th coming to the white, but this wasn't concerning because I pitched so late, meaning the tires had tons of life left, and I drove back to safe and cozy 11th place to finish Las Vegas. Marlin won the race, and I did not finish top 10. This left me 7th in points, 60 back from the lead, and behind 6 entire drivers. Things were going well, but they could be going better. For race forward Atlanta, I got the pole on the first lap and drove off like nothing. It was mostly A-level drivers up front, so I was hoping they would pack up and start shuffling positions behind me. The car was incredibly loose late into the run, so much so that I pitted before locking the most laps lead bonus. I decided to add Wedge as a result, and this was a mistake. It is important to note that unlike in career mode, arcade mode and season mode pit crews are also middle of the road and generally have decent 16 second pit stops. This is going to be especially helpful since the pit crew has cost me more than once in these challenges. Coming off the pit lane, I saw Jimmy Jones in behind him. I knew I couldn't let him finish well this week, so I laid on the brake. Several drivers that already pit went right past us. Johnny Benson blew up on lap 10, and we cycled out in 6th place. We were making good gains and points, but I wanted more! Jared and Newman were 2nd and 3rd, and I did not want them getting any more points than they needed. It took several laps to catch them, but we got there at the 2 to go mark once again. Jeff Burton had the lead. He is around the same tier as Michael Waltrip, so I had no problem letting him win this race. Blocking two lanes isn't that difficult, but getting the AI to pass each other when the track is bottled up like this is difficult. I had to let Newman go in order to let some cars actually pass. I failed to keep Johnson behind me, and with the white flag coming this time by, I had to let him go. Coming to said white flag, Tony Stewart decided to destroy the entire field from ninth on back. I found myself in an island in 8th place with no one closing behind me. This was a problem because if I slowed down too much, the AI would fly past me or worse, run into me and give me stupid logo rivals. Neither of those things happened, however, and I managed to once again finish in 11th. I now found myself 5th in points, but 85 behind the leader Newman. It was clear that Newman and Johnson were going to be a problem in this playthrough. Race 3 of 2003 is in Darlington. I completely blew the first turn, but still somehow got the pole on lap 1. Darlington is an interesting track because the racing surface is so small that the AI has difficulty passing each other under normal race conditions. I was hoping this would make it easier for me to decide who gets to pass and who is going to get held up. When the time came to start manipulating the field, I had nothing but A-level drivers behind me. No one wanted to cooperate, and Stewart drove around me like nothing. Not ideal, but not the end of the world either. I eventually let the 8 go because I hadn't seen him all season, really. I wasn't happy with any of the drivers behind me at this point, and got another 30 on lap 12. Eventually, the white flag was out, and I was still in fifth. The problem was that basically everyone behind me was high in points, so I couldn't decide who to slow down. Eventually, I just had to let a column get past while holding up the 48. The same exact thing happened again with Johnson this time, but I held on to finish in 11th once again. It was a devastating Tony Stewart victory that only meant I had just made things more difficult on future me. In fact, Stewart had tied me in points following this race, us being a 56 behind the leader. 
Every race up to this point has been pretty straightforward, but the next race is at... Bristol! And there is nothing straightforward about Bristol. There is only one thing that fundamentally matters at Bristol in NASCAR Thunder 2004. It isn't how good you are at racing, it isn't how well you get through traffic, and it isn't even how fast you are in qualifying. The only thing that matters at Bristol is how the 22 of Warburton feels that day. I've never been good at qualifying at Bristol and started this race in ninth. I really wanted to start out front and get some laps led, but that was clearly not meant to be. Everyone ahead of me in points was having a great day all the way until the pit cycle began. I just stayed out and prayed to the racing gods, and they delivered. Ward Burton brought out the caution by exiting the pit lane on lap 13 like the absolute stud that he is. This left very few cars on the lead lap, but could you believe it, Tony Stewart somehow got off the pit lane before me despite demonstrably not. I played it a bit more cautious than usual here and Stewart started driving off. I did what I could to catch back up and made the pass on lap 16. Now all I had to do was hold up the 20 car. Fun fact! Another fun thing about NASCAR Thunder 2004 is that caution plays completely ruin AI pit strategy, meaning there was a good chance that everyone in front of Stewart was going to run out of fuel before the end of the race. The race leader had nearly put us a lap down by the time we were nearly out of the top 10, and that is of course when the cars in front of us decided they needed to pit and give us more positions on the track. And just like that, we were back into the top 5, and Stewart was eager to get past me. This was the last thing I needed, so of course, this is what happened. Eventually, the white flag came out for the leader, and I just couldn't catch Stewart, so I gave up. Kevin LePage got a top 10, and Casey Mears did not. Bill Elliott was the winner of this race, and this was still good enough to catch me up to 42 points behind the leader. I now only had four drivers ahead of me in the standings meaning I could hopefully focus on screwing them out of points instead of trying to hold up every A-level driver I came across. Things were looking up, mostly because the next race is at Texas, which is an awful track in reality, but a great track in this game. I got the pole in the first lap, but did not lead the first lap. When the time for manipulation came, can you believe it was Stewart in a second? Fun fact! When I originally came up with the screwing over people strategy, I was playing NASCAR 07 for the channel, and it was in fact Tony Stewart that I was screwing over. This was the only way to fairly gain points on Tony Stewart, because I had to start last in every single race, so I couldn't start up front and hold him up any. So I had to find tracks that we were really good at, get in front of Stewart, screw him over, bring out the caution and restart in dead last and just hope that he managed to stay back there while I managed to drive back up through the field. NASCAR 07 is probably like the most famous playthrough on this channel that isn't like, you know, a Five Nights at Freddy's video. People still talk about it to this day. It's a, it's a landmark series for the channel. It's, uh, it's good stuff. I, I do say the N-word in a video though, so maybe don't. Maybe don't search for that. I spent multiple laps running all over the track trying to keep three wide A-level drivers behind me. Eventually, a newcomer approached me. The 97 of Kurt Busch was looking for a win. It took a lot of finagling, but eventually Kurt Busch got around me and drove off to an easy win. At this point, a trickle of drivers not named Tony Stewart began getting by me. I wanted Newman to get around me and not Stewart at the line, but Newman refused to drive past me, so I had to absolutely slam on the brakes coming to the line and somehow, barely, managed to finish 11th by only one one thousandth of a second. This was the closest I came all year to finishing 10th and thereby failing this challenge. It was a terrifying moment, but what was more terrifying was the 62 point deficit I had to Ricky Rudd. And even more terrifying was the next track on the schedule. The next race was at Talladega, and I knew I needed to be maximizing points every week, so I made the long, lonely journey through both laps of qualifying and got the pole. In the race, I tried my best to keep Bobby Labonte behind me because I hadn't seen him all season. This was short-lived as people began pitting as early as lap 3. There are dangerous overlaps in the AI driver lines at this track, so every pit cycle has a real chance of becoming a caution flag. I stayed out as long as possible to leave most laps and came down lap 6. I took all four tires to make sure I didn't get too far ahead of the field. With two laps to go, I was blocking the whole field again. Well, 
the whole field except for one. The last car to stop was Johnny Benson, and he came completely by himself with three laps to go. In any other race, this would be a death sentence, but today? Today I was looking for new winners. All I had to do was hold the field at around 150 miles an hour, and it left a big enough gap for Johnny to return to the track with an all but guaranteed win. At this point, I just held up Ricky Rudd since he was so far ahead of me in points. Jeff Green took 10th place, and Casey Mears finished 11th once again. It was a great outcome and left me only 49 points back, all the way up in a second in points. The next event took place at Martinsville, which is another J-O-K-E of a track in NASCAR Thunder 2004. I got 32nd on lap 1, but the pole on lap 2. I once again found myself blocking A-level drivers until Elliott Sadler and Kurt Busch got by. Everything was running smoothly until lap 14. I stayed out as long as possible to try to get some more laps led and ran out of gas. This was fine and I took service with no issues, but when I returned to the track, the caution cutscene triggered. As it turns out, Christian Fittipaldi decided to cause the other caution glitch in this game once again, leaving me probably by myself on the lead lap. This was essentially the best possible thing that could have happened in this race, as it gave me around 10 laps of virtually risk-free race manipulation. Of course, that's what would have happened if the game didn't decide to crash on the game logo during the transition. I have played this game for thousands of hours, ran hundreds of full 100% race distance events, and never in my 11 years of playing NASCAR Thunder 2004 on PS2, have I ever seen it crash in the middle of a race. I cannot tell you how happy I am that Tony Raines is almost done. All that being said, I had to reset the game and do Martinsville again. This time I qualified third, and no one nearly as interesting as Sadler or Bush were up front. I found myself blocking three lanes of traffic at Martinsville somehow, and only getting more and more annoyed by the lap. It wasn't until Dale Jr. decided that he really, really wanted to go to my inside at lap 7 that I let the dark side take over. In my defense, I did not touch Earnhardt once this entire straightaway. He has no one to blame but himself. I did not pit under this caution and the game flashed up the bigger picture, reminding me that my only competition at the moment is Ricky Rudd. This led to me completely failing to hold up Rudd, eventually turning him into the first logo rival of the challenge. Don't worry, he won't be the last. The pit cycle ran with no super useful caution because of course it did, and Ricky Rudd continued to annoy me. Eventually, Stewart found his way around me, and this was not acceptable. I got back past him and held him up so the field could catch up. This led to a nice collision that took Ricky Rudd out of the race. This was perfect. I would be gaining a ton of points on Rudd this week. I continued blocking Stewart and finished ahead of him in 11th place, and Kurt Busch became the first repeat winner of the playthrough. The news just kept getting better and better too, because after race 9 of 2003, I had the points lead for the first time in this challenge, with zero top 10s to my name. This was just the beginning though. Don't think it gets any easier from here. The next race was at California. I was not at all used to driving this track and ended up 19th to start. If you think that's bad, don't worry. It gets worse. I did not get to the lead before the pit cycle started. When I did pit, I came out with Matt Kenseth and decided my best bet was to try and get him the win this week. Roush Racing, running wild apparently in 2003, the AI disagreed and I found myself blocking the classic duo of Dale Jr. and Stewart. These two would just not cooperate and seem bent on running side by side to the end of the race. I managed to get Kenza to second but at the expense of letting Stewart go. I took the L and watched as Stewart drove away with the win. I was not paying attention at all at this point, and soon way too many cars got by on the outside, and I found myself 13th going 20 miles per hour slower than everyone else. This was too much to overcome, and I failed to finish 11th for the first time in 2003. This finish was a complete waste of 6 points, and that may not seem like much even in the old points format, but once again, someone is guaranteed to make up at least 40 points on me every single race. There are no off weeks or mulligans in this challenge, especially 
when Tony Stewart is on the case. Next up was Richmond, one of my favorite tracks in this game. Repeat after me. I completely blew the first lap, but still got the pole. I wanted to clear Stewart to keep him at bay, but this of course led to run leading lap one. I easily got by, however, and held the lead for the whole first run. The car decided to completely fall off a cliff, however, and was so undrivable that I spun at the start of lap ten. Some cars had started to pit, meaning I would restart in 18th. Can you believe that Stewart was the leader after this caution? It didn't take long to drive back into 5th, but at this point I completely hit a brick wall. The car was not performing the way it should have, and I was not going to be able to catch Stewart before the end of the race. The only way I got around Gordon was putting him in the wall for a 60 off of turn 2. At this point, I sat in front of the 24 and fell back to 11th, where I finished two laps later. This was, of course, another win for Stewart and another reminder that there are no off weeks in this challenge. I was now third in points, 63 back from Stewart. This man just cannot give me a break. The next event was the All-Star Open, which does not matter at all in this challenge. Jerry Nadeau won this race, and I finished last. Next up was the Coke 600. For the longest race in NASCAR, I got the pole on lap 1 and drove off like usual. The AI in this game completely cheat while getting on the pit road. Every single track, they somehow manage to find a grip lane that allows them to fly on the pit lane with a pace that wouldn't even make sense on fresh tires. With the large lead that I had, I decided to try and angle my way onto the pit lane using up the entire track to see if entering pit road like the AI is feasibly possible. This did not happen, and the caution was out once again. This caution ruined the AI's pit strategy, and Stewart stayed out. This meant that he was going to get 5 bonus points for leading a lap, but it also meant that he was going to pit under green and lose a ton of points that way. So, I was okay with this. Eventually, the time finally came to start slowing people down. I managed to get Michael Waltrip to the lead by a hefty margin, and held up Harvick. As we were falling through the field, people kept getting by, and yet I was not losing positions. I knew I needed to get outside of the top 10, but I didn't want to finish worse than 11th if I didn't have to, and I started pausing the game to see who behind me was actually for position. It all worked out in the end, though, and I came in a line to finish 11th for the 11th time in 2003. And Michael Waltrip took the win in the Coke 600. Stewart was not letting up, though, and I still had 31 points to make up on him. But thankfully, the gap behind me in points was starting to open up. So hopefully, I would only need to focus on Stewart in the next race. Next up was Dover, where I got the pole and drove off. On lap 12, I started slowing down for the crowd and let Rusty Wallace go by. From there, Gordon and Stewart were both trying to get around me, and I slowed down a ton. Eventually, I found my way to the inside to try and force Gordon to go up to the track. I did the same with Stewart and pushed them all the way back to 16th. I still had five laps left and wasn't concerned about getting back to 11th. Stewart even got held up on the outside behind me and began losing even more spots. This was critical because Stewart was so far ahead of me I needed to gain even more points on him. If I finished in 11th and Stewart finished 12th, I would only gain 13 points on Stewart, which meant I was going to need to do this more often. I finished in 11th once again, and Stewart finished all the way back in 21st, where he only gained 100 points versus my 140 points for finishing 11th and leading the most laps. This left me 9 points ahead of Stewart and in the points lead once again. The next race was at Pocono. Fun fact, Casey Mears has two ARCA wins at Pocono. I got the pole on lap 1 and drove off. At lap 7, I struggled to keep Gordon behind me and slowed down a ton. This caused a chain reaction and a caution to come out. No one DNF'd, so I didn't care about this wreck. When the restart happened, I continued screwing Stewart the hardest and fell back to 11. I was trying to get Burton and Benson to pass the Bonnie, but they didn't feel like it, which only held me up, and Rusty made up a bunch of starts on the outside. This left me in 12th for Pocono, and Johnson won the race. But I still had a 25 point lead. So it wasn't all bad. Only Stewart and Rudd were within a race of me as long as I finished 11th in the next race. Next up was Michigan, and I got the pole on the second lap. I've been known to speed on the pit lane at Michigan in basically every NASCAR game, including that one race in core that I'm still not over five years later. The car was driving really good, and I pit with no issues on lap six. 
I did a bad job of holding up Gordon and caught him on lap 8. He was blocking like an asshole and apparently this was my fault. I was running out of time and needed to get ahead of Gordon, so when I sent it coming to the white, Gordon of course held onto my rear quarter the entire corner, which resulted in a 100 rival. This extremely necessary turn of circumstance meant he would be an 80 rival next week and a 60 rival the week after that, meaning he will run into me, if I am next to him at all, for the next two races. I didn't want him to finish ahead of me because of his bitchy blocking earlier, but once he got alongside of the white, I played it safe and let him go for 10th. Finishing in 11th once again as Ken Zith won his third race of the season. I had a 53 point lead after Michigan, a full race ahead as long as I finished 11th. So I was excited to maybe be able to have some fun at Infinium. My pole time at Infineon was 109.03, which wasn't great, and I wasn't really sure how I was planning on playing this race. By turn 6, I decided to let the number 6 go past, since I hadn't seen Mark all season. At this point, it became a game of block Jeff Gordon at all costs. I slowed up the field a ton and just let Mark drive off to an enormous lead before pinning on lap 3. This massive gap between 1st and 2nd eventually meant absolutely nothing as I somehow managed to pass Mark off the pit lane at the white. Not only that, but there were somehow 3 cars even further down the road. I have never seen Bill Elliott win on a road course in this game and yet here he was! in the lead. From here I got ahead of Stewart and held him up like usual. He kept running into me and blaming me for doing so, which led to an 80 rival. I kept getting more rival points for no reason, but Ashton Lewis finished in 10th. I finished in 11th and Bill Elliott won at Infinium. Stewart was falling in points by now and it was once again Ricky Rudd up to second, fighting back strong after the DNF at Martinsville. Like I've said a hundred times by now, there are no off weeks in this challenge, so it was once again time to return to Daytona at my A game. I got third place on lap one, but can you believe the game put Stewart on the pole for this race? So I did the second lap to move up one row and get the pole. I once again let Mark go and hoped he would get redemption after last week. I also started a share draft with Jeff Green in hopes that he might even steal the win. None of this actually came to pass, of course, and it came down to a battle between Matt Kenseth and Michael Waltrip. Kenseth had been putting together some good races lately, so I took the safe route and let Waltrip get a huge lead. I fell back to 11th with Newman behind me, and Michael Waltrip took another win. Ricky Rudd did finish ahead of me, however, so I only had a 25-point lead. Everyone else was pretty far back at this point, so it looked like Chicagoland should have been pretty straightforward. For race 18 of 2003, I got the pole on the first lap. There were some heavy hitters starting behind me in 3rd and 5th, etc. So I decided to employ a new manipulation strategy for the first time in this challenge. On the start, I did not launch very fast, allowing the outside line to make up a ton of time on the start. This screwed over the entire inside line, dropping all of them multiple positions. This is a strategy I created during my first ever Casey's Angel save file, which, when employed correctly, can get the car in the last row on the outside as high as 22nd on the first lap of the race. This gave me plenty of room to work with in this race. I only led a couple of laps, but that was more than I had been leading lately, and I gave Mark Martin a huge lead once again. I couldn't wait to find out how he was going to disappoint me this week. I did the best I could to hold up Rudd, even brake checking him at the line to make sure he finished 13th instead of 12th. This was a three-point swing that could make all the difference in the long run. Mark Martin finally won, and I was now 36 points ahead of Rudd in the standings. The next race was at New Hampshire, which is sometimes a fun track. I got the pole and tried to hold up Gordon and get Kenny Wallace in the lead. The 23, of course, did not cooperate at all, and out of nowhere, Johnny Benson came flying into the lead. This was an absolutely incredible sight, watching Ultimate 23 Dragons, two favorite drivers, battling for the lead at New Hampshire. Absolutely poetic. Eventually, I decided to take the lead for the bonus points and Benson pit on lap 8. This, some fucking how, was a 60, and I pit next time by. 
Remember how I have no control over the quality of the pit crew? Well, this was the first stop of the season that the pit crew decided they did not feel like contributing. So we had a 19 and a half second pit stop. I was completely screwed at this point. We were all the way back in 25th and I had no time to get up to the front and manipulate the race. So I was completely at the mercy of NASCAR Thunder 2004. It was not easy driving through the field and I got so sick of rival points coming up and seeing people's stupid faces that I kept canceling the animation with Share Draft. Because I hadn't suffered enough yet, this was a 30 and this was a 60. Stupid ass Dale Jr. gave me 90 rival points at the end of this race for no reason. But I did manage to finish 11th in the end. On a less good note, Johnny Benson failed to beat Kurt Busch. Next up was the second Pocono race. I got the pole in the first lap, but having a clean start was too much to ask for. The exact same thing that happened in both Pocono races in the last challenge video happened in this race. This was a 60 and I did not lead lap 1. I did lead just fine after this until lap 7. Once again, up at the front was none other than Kurt Busch. He drove around me while I was holding up Jimmy Johnson. I got Rudd to try and pass me down the front stretch and was able to hold him up, letting two columns of cars get by on the outside. Everything was looking great until two laps to go when a debris caution came out. This set up a one lap dash to the finish. On the restart, I tried to keep Rudd up high, but he wasn't having it, and I was getting PTSD to a major flashpoint in the history of this channel. I knew what was coming this time, however, and got on the brakes and did not get taken out. I was hoping Rudd would die in the wall, but he was clearly only trying to kill me because he survived just fine, and soon enough, we were three wide for 12th place. I had a huge advantage in the tunnel turn, so I easily drove into 11th, where I would finish once again. Annoyingly, the caution cost Kurt Busch the win, and the world would have to suffer another Jeff Gordon victory. It left me with a 36-point lead, heading into race 21. Indianapolis is my worst track in this game, but I still got the pole on lap 1. The evidence of this came on lap 4, when I was just trying to complete the corner, and this happened. It of course was a 60, but I managed to pull a 360 and hang on to 4th place. This once again ruined the AI's pit strategy and we restarted in a stout 35th place with 4 laps to go. The AI naturally picked the absolute worst time to run out of gas and it cost me 11th place. I came to the line in 12th and the pain was only going to get worse from here as Jeff Gordon had back to back wins. Of course he was second in points coming into this race so this dropped me to second 7 points back. But the bigger news here was Kurt Busch in third place. He never does this well naturally. It was nice to see. For now, the next race is at Watkins Glen, which is a fun track to drive, but absolutely awful to race the AI. I did not get the pole in the first lap and finished lap two with a 106.62, which was fine. I was careful into the first turn like always and was back to second when a caution came out. I got to the line with the lead, but this meant nothing because the lap doesn't tick over until the restart, meaning that after pinning and coming out 16th, I did not get a lap led bonus point. At this point, I just did what I could to make up spots. I wasn't sure if people were going to run out because if a caution comes out on a 10% road course race, the AI usually can somehow make it to the end without hitting. I was running 12th coming to the finish and was holding up Stewart like always. I wasn't going to get 11th. But hey, I was still going to be able to beat Stewart in a Watkins Glen race, which felt nice. Coming to the finish line, I got my answer. The AI actually does run out if they don't pit. It just doesn't happen until the literal last corner. Brett Bodine stopped in front of me, and this sent the car spinning. I did what I could to survive and came to the line in reverse. But not before the 20 of Tony Stewart got around me, and I finished 12th. I could not believe that Brett Bodine had completely bamboozled me and cost me a finish to Tony Stewart at Watkins Glen. It's like this game is sentient. The good news is I somehow managed to get the points lead back after that race, but only by 8. Race 23 of 2003 is back in Michigan. I got the pole on lap 1. I got the pole on lap one, but noticed that most of my main points rivals were starting on the outside lane, so I decided to employ the Casey's Angel strats. This is a lot more difficult to do on the outside row, so I just did what I could. 
I had Dale Jr., Ricky Rudd, Jeff Gordon, all of them caught in the two outside rows as Mike Skinner and Kevin LePage went by on the bottom. I was pretty happy with this manipulation and even managed to drive back past all 15 of these cars and get the lead by lap 6. This is when I decided to pit and get down under 70 miles per hour. Obviously, this wasn't good enough for Kurt Busch, who ran directly into me. This caused the car to speed up over 70 miles per hour and gave me a speeding penalty. What the fuck, bro? I am literally not allowed to play NASCAR games without getting speeding penalties in Michigan, apparently. So there I was, taking two tires to make sure I got out in the lead, which was important because it turned out to be Newman trying to get the top spot. I began to try holding him up, but the shitty tires meant I had no control, and I immediately wrecked trying to slow him down. The caution cutscene never hit, and I kept losing positions. When the restart finally did happen, I was all the way back in 17th. With half-dead tires, the car refused to hold the bottom, so I kept getting run into and losing spots. To the point the best spot I could finish was 12th. I have already lost at least 12 points to these stupid incidents, which was incredibly annoying. Even more annoying was another Tony Stewart win. The good news is that I still led points, so not all was lost after this one. The next race brings us back to Bristol, meaning once again, the only thing that matters is waiting for the caution. I once again still cannot qualify at this track and start a 10th, which was just fantastic. The leader was Kurt Busch, so I wasn't losing too much here. Lap 13 hit, and Ward Burton decreed that on this day, yes, the caution was going to come out. This trapped more cars a lap down than earlier this year, but can you believe it? Stewart was once again not one of them. How does he do it? I had way more confidence in the car this time and actually caught and passed Stewart quickly. Holding him up was more of a challenge, though, and he kept getting around me. Dude absolutely refused to be held up, and I kept getting wrecked every time I got in front of him. This was timed at the absolute worst possible moment, and a caution came out at the two-to-go mark. This meant that when the race restarted, the white flag was already out. I had no time to fall back any further, so I had to let Stewart go. As more and more cars passed me, I realized something. There aren't 11 cars on the lead lap. Every single car on the track passed me, and I was only in ninth place. After the other cars took the checker, they still did not pass me, and I was stuck in P9. I thought I was completely screwed until I turned the car around like of a revolution and went back over the line. When I hit the line, the game decided I was on lap 24 instead of 25, which sent me back to the lowest car one lap down. Annoyingly, this was 28th place. It soon became very clear that I was either about to fail this challenge or lose a shit ton of points and finish 28th. I didn't want to do it, but I had to accept defeat, and I finished in 28th. But now I had to figure out a way to end the event, so I ran the car out of fuel in hopes that DNFing would lock the 28th place finish. It did! and Johnny Benson took his second victory of 2003. I got an entire 84 points for finishing 28th, and this sent me 23 points behind Stewart in the standings. I knew I had used what can only be described, it was going to be all hands on deck to get this points lead back. The next race took us back to Darlington. I got the pole and drove off and led up to lap 12. I let Labonte take the lead and went back to the usual of holding up Rudd and Stewart. Things were going fine until Gordon got by, so I drove him back down to hold him up. This of course meant that no one was going to cooperate for the rest of the race, so no progress was made for a few laps. Kenseth blew up immediately after passing us, which didn't help in the slightest. Stewart once again kept running into me, so he was now a 100 rival. This led to him getting alongside me with two laps to go, where he took himself out for absolutely no reason. It was very stupid, but it cost him a lot of spots, so I wasn't too mad. Everything went smooth until the end, where I once again finished 11th, but discovered something very important. 
I slammed on the brakes at the line, but even though I was way out ahead of Gordon, he checked up anyway. This led to me crossing the line 11th, Harvick in 12th, and Gordon in 13th. This was a huge discovery, because it meant I did not need to be right in front of someone to hold him up. The AI actually anticipates brake checks from a far distance. This would allow me to line guys up better and hopefully make manipulating the running order a lot easier on big tracks. After Darlington, I was second to Newman in points with several cars right there within striking distance. These last couple of races weren't going to be easy. So for race 26 at Richmond, I was looking for some kind of redemption. I got the pole and noticed there were several interesting people in the inside lane. So I pulled a Casey's Angel start and let five cars go on the outside. It wasn't all sunshine and LGBTQIA plus flags though because my 80 rival Stewart was the leader. I decided to try and jump him on the pit lane a lap early. This did not happen and I had to work to get around him. Once I did, it was an easy pass and I was holding up Stewart a ton. Eventually someone ran into Stewart from behind which knocked the 20 car into me. I don't know if this was any rival points, but knowing this game, it was probably a 30. I managed to hold up Stewart and Gordon, and I felt super validated after the awful Richmond race from earlier. I managed to knock them both out of the top 10 and finished 11th once more. Michael Waltrip won yet again, and we were 23 points out of the points lead with 10 races to go in 2003. Good stuff. Since I was still behind in points, I decided to go back to maximizing points early in the race. I hadn't gotten a lot of bonus points lately, which was just leaving points on the table for no reason. I led all the way until lap 8, and once the cycle was over, I caught Ricky Run and started holding him up. Michael Waltrip was up front once again, so I let him go like always. Rudd was cooperating really well today and accepted his fate of falling through the field. I did lose him with three to go, but wasn't going to let this hurt me. I drove him back down and was still racing with him into turn one on the white. I did everything I could to get him behind me and this left me with another logo rival and I was 14th place on the track. I only managed to recover to 12th because, of course, and that's where I finished in the race. Waltrip won yet again and now I was 8 points out of the lead, but had both Gordon and Rudd in front of me yet. What's worse is there were five entire drivers within striking distance of the points lead. At this point, I had to keep a mental list of all the cars I needed to block in every race, and that list was growing. Night Dover was another pole, another bunch of laps led, and another race with Ricky Rudd in the second. The supposed king of Dover, Mark Martin, got past me, and so did Rusty. It wasn't long before the two-car tandem that haunts my nightmares began forming behind me. I let Stewart by because I'm an idiot, and this cost me the inside on Rudd. Both cars got by, and I was ready to throw my controller. I didn't let it get me down, and I did get back past Rudd and hold him up some more. Now I had Rudd and Newman behind me. This was more rival points, and I was 11th on lap 16. I tried to pull the same moves I did on Stewart earlier this year and hold Rudd up on the outside. This didn't work, but I did end up finishing 11th. The King of Dover did not close in this race, and Rusty Wallace had another win in 2003. I thought this race went pretty well, but as it turns out, I am stupid, because I was now 4th in points, 27 behind the leader, Jimmy Johnson, with Gordon, Newman, and Rusty in front of me as well. This is one of the most frustrating challenges anyone can do in an NASCAR game. I am getting tired, man. Thankfully, there's only eight races left this year. And next up is Talladega. I forgot to record qualifying, but I started third and had the lead off turn two. Nothing happened in this race besides the pit crew costing us a bunch of time. Blocking people was pretty straightforward, and we finished 11th once again. I still didn't have the points lead, of course. Next up is Kansas, which is a track that I despise both in this game and in real life. The car drove horribly, and I did not get the pole. When the race went green, I had absolutely no pace and absolutely no hope. I did not intend to wreck here, and of course, everyone felt the need to run into me. It's crazy how this game works, though. Everyone that I needed to finish in front of stayed out under this caution, which screwed them over, forcing them to pit under green. The car was still undrivable, though, so I finished 17th, which is the worst result since Bristol. Astonishingly, 
I went to the point screen and found myself once again in the lead. Some sort of literal miracle transpired in this race and kept the challenge alive. The next race is at Charlotte. I got the pole, I led a bunch, blah, 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 and on lap 10, approaching in my rear view, was none other than Michael Waltrip. This man was on an absolute tear, but not actually because he was really low in points. I was more than happy to give him another win as it meant basically nothing in the standings. I was struggling to block both Gordon and Rusty and was second for a very long time. No one else was willing to cooperate, so I just fell back and finished 11th. Michael Waltrip won for the fifth time in 2003, and I was now 14 points behind Gordon with five races remaining in the season. Unfortunately, it was once again Martinsville time. I did get the pole this time and led some laps, but began falling through the field early. I gave Mark the lead even though he hated me and focused on holding up Rusty. I had Gordon Rusty in line behind me and everything was great on lap 8 until Ward Burton decided to give me no room and the caution was out once again. I wasn't all the way backwards, so the cutscene didn't immediately hit, but everyone on the track immediately hit my car, giving me a bunch of needless rival points. I was super annoyed by this and was not paying attention, so I pit the car. It was only lap 9, so that meant there was no way I'd make it to the end. That's not the biggest problem, however, due to the fact I would be deep in the field with no way to hold people up. I just hung out for the rest of the race until lap 17 when another caution came out. Christian Fittipaldi decided to throw it back to earlier in the video and brought out the caution coming out of the pit lane. I skipped the cutscene so the game wouldn't crash and pit the car. The pit crew did terrible, but I was the only car on the lead lap. This meant I got to work holding up Stewart. In fact, I slowed everyone down so hard that Jack Sprague stopped in the middle of turn 3 and brought out another caution. At this point, a bunch of cars were on the lead lap, which helped me lose positions. I held up the 8 cars well just to be safe and fell back to 9th. I was doing all I could to hold up Gordon, and this ended poorly. When the leader took the white, they were three wide behind me, and Gordon got some funny ideas. He drove all the way down into turn three and hit the pit barrows, bouncing up the track and causing an absolutely cataclysmic incident. People were upside down and on fire, and the entire track was blocked. When I came around, I had no idea what to do. I didn't want to pit because I'd hit the line and probably finish top ten, so I just stopped the car to bore witness to the carnage. It was an absolute parking lot. Everyone on the track got into this wreck, including me and even Mark Martin, the winner of the race, decided to get a piece of it after taking the checkered and also decided to give me 10 more rival points. I just sat there and waited for people to despawn while taking stock. If I crossed the line, I would without a doubt finish top 10, so once again I went backwards to the finish line. When I crossed the line, I only fell to 15th but I didn't want to settle for 15. I decided to run the car out of the gas on the white flag lap to see where I would finish in that scenario. As it turns out, I ran out of gas and finished 12th. This was the second strangest finish to a race so far, but I did leave Martinsville leading the points by 26 over Gordon. For Atlanta, I did the same thing as always and led the race until lap 13. Kurt Busch was right behind me, and for once, I was not eager to let him by. In fact, I let Tony Stewart take the lead before I let Kurt. I finished this race in 11th, and Kurt finished 5th. This left me only 15 points ahead of Busch going into Phoenix. But the good news is that no one else was within a race of me, so I had officially managed to recover from that 28th place finish at Bristol. I was really hoping the last three races of the year would be simple. So I got the pole at Phoenix and led the first five laps. Rudd was a full race back in points by now, so I let him go and he took the lead. I focused entirely on holding up Kurt Busch and pit on lap 9. Now would have been an excellent time for the pit crew to show up. They did not, and I came back onto the track in 19. This was devastating and the car wasn't running as well as it had been earlier. I was not making up any time at all, so I had to hope the running order out front was good. Kurt Busch, of course, was running fifth, even though I was holding him up the entire race to that point. So no, it was not going good out front. I crossed the line in 11th and Rudd won. With two races to go in 2003, I was five points behind Kurt Busch. Gordon had closed in as well. 
This was not going to be as simple as I had hoped. I got the pole on lap one like always and drove off. But this time the start wasn't as good and Kurt really tried to ruin my day into turn three. I have never driven this far into turn three on the apron and had no idea how this would end. But somehow, neither of us died, and Kurt Busch did not lead a lap. I let Ricky Craven go by, hoping he would just randomly get the win today. If anything, he would at least be able to beat Kurt. The car just didn't feel like operating on lap four, however, so of course, this was a 60. This meant that when I tried to pass Craven on lap six, he killed me for no reason, and the caution was out. No one else pit because it wasn't the fuel window, and I restarted dead last. I took the opportunity to get the most laps led here, and came out of the pit lane eventually in second. I found Bobby Labonte, who was up to third in points, and let him go for fifth. I just made sure to keep Kurt behind me and fell through the field. I finished in 11th ahead of Kurt Busch, but Gordon finished third. This meant that heading into Homestead, as long as I finished 11th, only three cars could beat me in the championship. Those being Kurt Busch, Bobby Labonte, and points leader, Jeff Gordon. I could afford to let Busch and Labonte finish like 7th and 8th, but no better. If I was going to win this championship, I had to lead the most laps at Homestead and beat Jeff Gordon. I held the lead easily and stayed out until lap 8 after securing most laps led. This would have been the absolute worst possible time to have a bad pit stop. So of course the pit crew screwed up and cost me time. This didn't actually matter in the end because the only drivers of concern were Labonte, Gordon, and Kurt, who I had right behind me on lap 10, and I managed to hold up a ton on the back stretch. Kurt nearly killed me in a turn one on lap 11, so I let him go, but at that point the damage was already done. Not only was he this far back, but I didn't see Gordon and Labonte at all. I let Kurt drive off and just had to maintain till the end of the race. But I was getting concerned though as Kurt was making up a ton of time, but with laps winding down, I just could not get up there and do anything about it. When the checkered flag waved, I finished in 11th once again. Gordon and Labonte were still nowhere to be found, but Kurt Busch wasn't that far behind me. He might have gained enough points to take the championship. There was only one way to find out. I couldn't believe it. After 36 races, after getting no finishes better than 11th for the entire Cup Series season, I still managed to win the Cup Championship. And I did it by only six points over Kurt Busch. If he had gained two more spots at the end there, he would have won the championship which he would have actually deserved with 3 wins and 21 top 10s and 11.4 average finish. I, on the other hand, won the championship with 29 poles, 0 wins, 0 top 5s, 0 top 10s, and an 11.9 average finish. And I also led the season with 207 laps led. So basically I pulled a John Andretti in NASCAR Thunder 2003. The most wins went to Stewart and Michael Waltrip with five each, and the only other driver with more than one pole was Kurt Busch with two. This was an insane challenge that was actually moderately difficult at times, and honestly, going into it, I didn't know whether or not it would even be possible. But as it turns out, you can replicate Casey Mears' 2003 rookie season numbers and still win the Cup Series Championship. I bet someone is going to watch this video and say that this is the reason the win and you're in chase format exists. How about shut up, actually? Man, shut the fuck up! Get the fuck out of here! Anyway, that's gonna do it for this one. Thanks for watching. This has been Comic Cos Games doing another NASCAR Thunder 2004 challenge. Um, I don't want to say this, but like, I'm kind of running out of ideas for challenges. There's only so many things you can do in a NASCAR game, so, I mean... If anyone's got like any ideas for challenges, please comment them or send them to me on, on, on X. Send them to me on X or on Discord. I'm always on Discord. So yeah, y'all should like do that because oh my goodness gracious, uh, these videos do really well. 
<laughs> and they're fun to make. These are good. To, it's interesting to um, play through the challenges not knowing if they're even possible and then just watching as things develop and just the insane things that happen when you're trying to force the game into doing things that shouldn't be possible. I mean, just, I mean, just in this video, we had the uh, races at Bristol and Marmsville where I had to, like, go backwards and, like, lose a bunch of spots that way. Like, I haven't ever had to do that. In no other context are you gonna have to do that. So, yeah, if anyone's got any good ideas for videos, do not hesitate. Do not hesitate to comment them, and I will, I will, I will give you credit. Don't you worry, I will give you credit. I, I, I don't know, man. I don't know what else you want to say. Press the join membership button. Do that. It's only two ninety nine a month and stuff. Anyway, yeah, this video is actually this one's pretty short. I thought this video would be longer. Interesting. Anyway, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop talking. Thanks for watching. See you whenever I do next. Bye. We are going to find out today. Can you win a championship in NASCAR Thunder? Tell oh God. Oh God. Why the voice crack? Of course, that's what would have happened if this game decided. If this game decided. Uh... I held the lead. What even was that sound? What even was that sound? Bruh. This is one of many moments that I forgot to mention in my defense of Casey Mears video. I should probably redo that video someday. Oh, I have so many. I have so many videos on the backlog, though. Oh, I hate my life. Fun fact: the. This extremely necessary turn of events. This extremely necessary. The only way I got around Gordon was putting him the wall off. Uh. I've been known to speed on the pit lane at Michigan in basically every NASCAR game, including that one race in core that I'm still not over five years later. I did a. <laughs> I was joined by Stewart on the front row. <laughs> what a fucking voice crack. <laughs> oh, this is so bad. There's gonna be so many out. This this video is just gonna have like three minutes of outtakes at the end. Oh, I'm so I'm so not okay right now. But notice that most of my main points rivals were on the outside, so I just pulled it up. Shut up, Kamikaze. Just read the script. When the restart finally did. Oh, ooh, ooh. That was not a great burp. It could have been better. Honestly, I don't even know what to say about this one. <laughs> Casey Mears.